Now yesterday we spent the entire hour on the deity of Christ. And I'd like to continue that and give you various things that you could study further and look up in Scripture along the area that Jesus claimed to be God and the New Testament presents Him as God. The deity of Christ means Jesus is God. Let's continue on. Next main point is Christ claimed authority over the laws and institutions of God. Christ claimed authority over the laws and the institutions of God. In Matthew 12, 6, over the temple, and also John 2, verse 18, the Jews therefore answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us, seeing that you do these things? Now they've been meeting and criticizing for uh, his actions against the temple. What sign do you give us? The reason is, in the Jewish writings, they figured that three people had authority over the temple. The high priest, the king, and the Messiah. And they knew he wasn't a priest, they knew he wasn't a king. And they said, what sign do you give us that you have a right to do this? And then he gave them a sign. Three days, as Jonah was in them, fell by the whale. And I think this brought out his messiahship there. In Matthew 12, 8, in other verses, you have his authority over the Sabbath. Authority over the Sabbath. And then in Matthew 5, 31 to 34. Matthew 5, 31 to 34, and also verses 38 and 39. You have his authority over the law. Authority over the law. First the temple, then the Sabbath, then the law. And then in Matthew 16:19. You have his authority over the kingdom of God. Matthew 16, 19. The kingdom of God. Next main point. Christ claimed to be the object of saving faith equally with God the Father. Christ claimed to be the object of saving faith equally with God the Father. In John 10.31, he is one with the Father. When he said, I and the Father are one, he is one with the Father. The Jews clearly understood what it meant. Because they said, Thou being a man, makest thyself out to be God. He is one with the Father. Next, men are to believe in him just as they believe in the Father. They are to believe in him just as they believe in the Father. John 14.1 Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Third, eternal life depended upon knowing God and Jesus Christ. Eternal life depended upon knowing God and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Eternal life depended on knowing the Father and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Next, Christ at times points to himself as the only object or the lone object of faith and devotion without any mention of the Father. Various times Christ points to himself as the object of faith and reverence without mention of the Father. Matthew 11:28, Come unto me and I will give you rest. Matthew 4:19, Follow me. John 3.36, believe on me. John 3.36, believe on me. Matthew 11.28, come unto me. Matthew 4.19, follow me. John 3.36, believe on me. John 14.15, John 14.15, love me. The human obligations and affections and ties, etc. are to be yielded to Christ. And no mention of the Father there. Next... Knowledge of God, which comes by faith, Jesus claimed to be through his own special act of revelation. The knowledge of God, which comes by faith, Jesus claimed to be through his own special act of revelation. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. This really expresses a unique relationship between the Son and the Father which in the context of the Jews is a claim to deity. 
Now we had Christ's claimed authority over the laws and the institutions, and then the next main point was Christ's claim to be the object of saving faith, equal with God the Father. Then we saw various things under there. Now another main point is Christ received honor and worship due only to God. Christ received honor and worship due only to God. Matthew 4, 8-12. Acts 12, 21-22. These here verses I'm giving you where it says that God alone receives worship. Limited to God alone. Then we'll show how it's applied to Christ. Matthew 4, 8 to 10, Acts 12, 21 to 23. Revelation 22, 8 and 9. Rev 22, 8 and 9. Acts 10, 25 and 26. Now note the times that Christ accepted worship. Matthew 14, 31 to 33. Matthew fourteen thirty one to thirty three. Matthew fifteen twenty five to twenty eight. Matthew fifteen twenty five to twenty eight and John five twenty three. Then there were some occasions that he demanded worship. Some occasions that Christ demanded worship. John five twenty three. Philippians two ten eleven. Now next main point. The New Testament, the Gospels and the Epistles, attributes works to Christ which are properly works of God alone. Works are attributed to Christ which according to Scripture should be attributed to God alone. Created all things, John 1, 3. Created all things, John 1, 3, Colossians 1, 16. Hebrews 1.10 The next Christ upholds all things. Colossians 1.17 Christ upholds all things. Then Christ directs and guides the course of history. Christ directs and guides the course of history. Hebrews 1.2 and 1 Corinthians 10.1-11 then the passage we covered before is Christ forgives sins. Mark 2. Matthew 9. Compared with Isaiah 43.25. Christ forgives sins. Prerogative that only God had restricted to him. Compared with Isaiah 43.25. Mark 2, 5-12. Christ bestows eternal life. John 10.28. Jesus said, I give to them eternal life. Christ bestows eternal life, John 10, 28. Christ will raise the dead at the resurrection. I don't know how anyone can read the New Testament and read the Gospels and not see that Jesus claimed, the New Testament writers claimed deity for him. Christ will raise the dead at the resurrection, John eleven twenty five. Christ hears and answers prayer, John 14, 14. John 14, 14. Next, Christ possesses the metaphysical attributes of God. Christ possesses the metaphysical attributes of God. Self-existence. John 1.4 In Him was life. John 14.6 says, I am the life. He does not say, I have life, but I am the life. John 14.6 Christ is unchangeable. Christ is unchangeable. Hebrews 13.8 and Hebrews 1.10-12 Christ is omnipresent. O-M-N-I-P-R-E-S-E-N-T Omnipresent. Matthew 28.20 and Acts 3.21 Christ is omniscient. O-M-N-I-S-C-I-E-N-T Omniscient John 4.16 Christ is omnipotent Omnipotent In John 5.19 He claims equality with God in power John 5.19 Revelation 1.8 He's called the Almighty
And then in Luke 4.39, power over disease. Luke 4.39, power over disease. Luke 7.14, power over death. Luke 7.14, power over death. Matthew 8, 26 and 27, power over nature. Christ claimed to be God. You can see why William Peter Wolf said, for anyone to read the New Testament and not see that Christ claimed to be God and they attributed deity to him would be a man standing outdoors in a clear day looking up and saying, I can't see the sun. His claims to deity. Now, the ones I would recommend that you study and get to know are the first six that I gave you yesterday and we went over in a little bit of detail. I think those would be very helpful for you. Now, let's go in to what I call in my book, The Trilemma. The Trilemma. Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus claimed to be God. Now, a lot of people say, no, you misunderstood him. That's not what he meant, etc., etc. Well, I think the passages are so clear that you could not say that. In C.S. Lewis, who was a professor at Cambridge University, once quite an agnostic, and the thing that caused C.S. Lewis to start changing his mind and eventually become a Christian was he had in his office the Atheist of Atheists from the continent. And surprised by joy, he brings out his book, that this man made the statement that when it comes to the historical evidence for the reliability of the Scriptures and the person of Jesus Christ, the Christians have a leg to stand on. Well, this hit C.S. Lewis right between the eyes. And he said, well, this atheist, if atheist has doubts about his position, what about me? And so he started to study the life of Christ. And in the last chapter of my book, Evidence and Demands a Verdict, I'd recommend you read the testimonies under skeptics being converted. C.S. Lewis, Sir William Ramsey, Papini, and others. And the background of C.S. Lewis is there and the struggle he went through. Well, he became a Christian. As he said, he came into the kingdom of God kicking. He was one of the most reluctant men ever to become a Christian. But he was driven to it by the evidence and the facts. And the overwhelming influence of the person of Jesus in his life. And he made this statement. He said, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him being Christ. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Don't you hear that all the time? Look, look, I'm willing to say he's a great teacher, great moral leader, etc. But he wasn't God. And Lewis goes on and says, That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a post egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. And then he goes on to say, You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with this patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not attend to. Period. You see, the other religious leaders put their teachings out in front and themselves in the background. Jesus put himself out in front. Other religious teachers would relate people to what they said. Jesus would relate people to who he was. This is why you have all the other religious leaders on one hand and Jesus Christ diametrically opposed to them. The issue with other men is what they said. The issue with Jesus was who he was. Somebody said to me in Latin America, he said, why did you start studying the life of Christ to find God? Or to refute God? I said, very simple. He was the only one claimed to be God. He was the only one to claim that the resurrection would confirm his claims as deity. And I said, it seems logical to start there. Why start with somebody who didn't even claim to be God? So I started out with the person of Jesus Christ. Like a Mohammedan fellow told me. He said, ah, you poor Christians. He said, we go to the tomb of our master and we have his body. You go to the tomb and it... And then he stopped. <laughs> and he just gained a tremendous theological insight. It's empty. And an historical insight. I don't know if he ever became a Christian, but he started to consider it. 
You cannot separate Jesus from his words. Moral rearmament says we need to take the teachings of Jesus around the world if they don't take Jesus with them. That's foolishness. Because no one can live the teachings of Jesus. It's supernatural. Unless there's the presence of Christ within that life. This is one of the problems in Alcoholic Anonymous. They present all the wonderful teachings of Christ, but they never introduce them to Christ. And it wasn't until my father, you know, he started getting involved in Alcoholic Anonymous, knew he was introduced to Jesus, that his life was changed. And no longer was it a struggle. Kenneth Scott Latterette, the great historian of Christianity at Yale University before he passed away not long ago, in the history of Christianity said, It is not his teachings which makes Jesus so remarkable, although these would be enough to give him distinction. It is a combination of the teachings with the man himself. The two cannot be separated. And he went on to say, It must be obvious to any thoughtful reader of the Gospel record that Jesus regarded himself and his message as inseparable. He was a great teacher, but he was more. His teachings about the kingdom of God, about human conduct, and about God were important, but they could not be divorced from him without, from his standpoint, being vitiated. End quote. Now, Jesus claimed to be God. We have several alternatives. We have two major alternatives. Now, this outline is in the book, and it's expanded. Chapter 7. I share this on the campus constantly. After I go through the four laws, somebody said, Well, I just quite can't believe in Christ. And I said, Well, let me give you some alternatives. And I'll go through this diagram. Two main alternatives. One, it's false. The other alternative is that it's true. It's either false or true. Now, if these claims were false, there are two alternatives. One is, he knew they were false. That is, that his claims were false. This would mean he made a deliberate misrepresentation. A deliberate misrepresentation. This would mean, actually, along with that, that he was a deceiver. To make it frank. He was a deceiver. This would mean, if a deceiver, then he was a liar. The direct misrepresentation, then he was a liar. Now, if he was a liar about what he said, then as C.S. Lewis said, he'd have to be a demon from the pit of hell. And if a demon, then that would mean he was a fool. He went out and died for it. One alternative, if his claims were false. He knew his claims were false. It mean a deliberate misrepresentation would make him a liar, a demon. Because he told all men that their eternal relationship with God was dependent upon him. And if that wasn't true, then he was a demon. And if a demon, a fool... Because he went out and got himself crucified for it. The other alternative is that he didn't know the claims were false. He didn't know the claims were false. This would mean that he was self-deceived. Self-deception. Or instead of self-deception, you can put down sincerely deluded. And if sincerely deluded, that'd make him a lunatic. One professor said to me, if Jesus was a lunatic, what about the rest of us? Now, the other alternative is that his claims were true, and that would make him Lord and God. We cannot come up with a patronizing nonsense that Jesus was a great teacher. He never left that option open. He never did. To say the things that Jesus said, and to claim the things that Jesus claimed, if they were not true... Dr. Philip Shaw, the historian, in his series on the history of the Christian church, said this, This testimony, if not true, must be downright blasphemy or madness. This is on page 110. The former hypothesis cannot stand a moment before the moral purity and dignity of Jesus, revealed in his every word and work, and acknowledged by universal consent. Self-deception in matters so momentous and with an intellect in all respects so clear and so sound, it is equally out of the question. How could he be an enthusiast or a madman who never lost his even balance of his mind, the even balance of his mind, 
who sailed serenely over all the troubles and persecutions as the sun above the clouds, who always returned the wisest answer to tempting questions, who calmly and deliberately predicted his death on the cross, his resurrection on the third day, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the founding of his church, the destruction of Jerusalem, predictions which have been literally fulfilled. A character so original, so complete, so uniformly consistent, so perfect, so human, and yet so high above all human greatness, can be neither a fraud nor a fiction. The poet, as has been well said, would in this case be greater than the hero. It would take more than a Jesus to invent a Jesus. If Jesus was not a liar and his claims are false, then he was a lunatic. A lunatic out of his mind. The psychiatrist J.T. Fisher says this, if you were to take the sum total of all authoritative articles ever written by the most qualified of psychologists and psychiatrists in the subject of mental hygiene, if you were to combine them and refine them and cleave out the excess verbiage, if you were to take the whole of the meat and none of the parsley, and if you were to have these unadulterated bits of pure scientific knowledge concisely expressed by the most capable of living poets, you would have an awkward and incomplete summation of the Sermon on the Mount and it would suffer immeasurably through comparison. For nearly 2,000 years, the Christian world has been holding in its hands the complete answer to its restless and fruitless yearnings. Here rests the blueprint for successful human life with optimum mental health and contentment. End quote. Was he a lunatic? A man that through a relationship with him has seen more lives changed than any other man in history? A lunatic? If Jesus was not a lunatic, then he was Lord and God. And I believe these are the only alternatives we have. He was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord and God. This is one thing I had to struggle with as a Christian. At an art showing, a very famous artist in a museum. The basic works were those of Rembrandt. And as they were closing up, the janitor, the caretaker, was going around making sure everything was okay and most of the people were leaving. And he heard two men criticizing a Rembrandt. And they were just tearing it apart, in reality, to other paintings and everything. And the caretaker said this, It's the viewers, not the artist, that's on trial. It's the viewers, not the artist, that's being judged or on trial. And when it comes to Jesus, it's not Jesus, but the viewers that are on trial. What think ye of Jesus? Let me tell you, the life of Christ stands so unique in all of history. Now remember, there were 400 years from the Old Testament being completed to these prophecies being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Malachi, the last book chronologically of the Old Testament was finished a little over 400 years before Christ. So there's a 400 year gap. Now many prophecies, of course, were a lot older, or much older than 400 years. They were written during the period of 1100 years. From 1100 years, from the time of Moses, around 1500 B.C., to that of Malachi, 400 B.C. And during this time, there was quite a succession of prophets. Prophecy ended at 400 B.C. In 1 Maccabees 9.27, that's the Apocrypha, 1 Maccabees 9.27, tells us, quote, Great affliction in Israel, such as there was not since the day that a prophet was not seen among them. In other words, they pointed out that they hadn't seen a prophet since the days of Scripture. And then it goes on and says, in 1 Maccabees 14.41, 1 Maccabees 14.41 and 4.46, points out the intense longing for the coming again of prophets, so that even in their public actions, men were careful to claim validity for their legislation only until a faithful prophet should rise again. They were very careful in the intertestamental period not to claim to speak from God until another prophet comes to speak in the name of God. Now, a lot of people say, 
Look. These prophecies weren't written down till the time of Christ. And they were written down then so they would coincide with his life. And a lot of Christians sit there in a the classroom and says, hmm, you got a point. Oh, no, they don't. Some people say, look, there couldn't be a 400 year gap because the Old Testament wasn't finished yet. It wasn't finished in about the time of Christ. Now, here's the answer to it. I say, okay, you don't have a 400 year gap? Let's just make it 250 then. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament was made when? Between 200 and 250 B.C. And the Septuagint shows there had to be at least a 200 year gap. It's a big deal if somebody says it's not 400 years, just make it 200. doesn't solve anything for them. A 200 year gap of them being written down before they were fulfilled is just as good as 400 years. And it's a Septuagint, the Greek translation shows that there was at least a 200 to 250 year gap. Because let's face it, you have a Greek translation, then you had to have a Hebrew translation for the scriptures to do it. So that answers the critic that says that these things were not written down until the time of Christ. Now it's interesting as you study history that there were many false messiahs. In fact, David Barron in The Rays of Messiah's Glory, the book, Rays of Messiah's Glory, David Barron calls attention to the fact that more than 40 false messiahs have appeared in the history of the Jewish nation. More than 40 false messiahs. But here's an important thing. Not one of them appealed to fulfill prophecy to substantiate their claims as a Messiah. Not one of them. Jesus was the only man that appealed to it that we can tell. And the reason is, he was the only one that could. Because if any of the others would have, they'd been exposed just like that. Jesus appealed to fulfill prophecy. The other ones didn't. Now I look at these prophecies as a great address. A great address. In evidence that demands a verdict, the chapter on Messianic prophecy, I took, I think it's 61 prophecies. Listed them, the prediction, the fulfillment, and then on most of them I put some quotes from Jewish leaders saying that this is a Messianic prophecy. The answer to the critics is, ah yeah, that's the way you Gentiles look at it. And then I would quote right from their Talmuds and their scripture and commentaries on the scriptures that they referred to these as Messianic passages. And then I listed in the back of that chapter 200 and some of the recorded prophecies. Sometimes a prophecy is a duplication where it was in one prophet prophesying, another prophet prophesying almost the same thing. So I put it under the same category even though they were separate prophecies. And then it's canon Linton and I documented in the chapter it says there's 333 prophecies. He spent a lifetime studying them. He said there's 333 prophecies in the Old Testament about the first coming of Messiah. And he said every single one of them was fulfilled in Jesus. Now I've listed most of them for you. Now when I look at the prophecies, I look at them as a great address. I look at it as God writing an address through prophecies to identify one man to come into the world. Let me show you what I mean. Your address is very unique. At least I know mine is. My address is Josh McDowell, 3934, North Lugo, apartment 14, San Bernardino, California, 92404, state of California, country USA, North American continent, late great planet Earth. <laughs> Do you know that that address separates me from three and a half billion people? For example, Lake Great Planet Earth separates me from all the other planets, North American continent from all the other continents, the United States from the other three countries, Canada and Mexico in the North American continent, and then there's Texas, and then <coughs> California separates me, my state, from all the other states in the United States, North American continent, Lake Great Planet Earth. San Bernardino separates me from all the other cities in the world. The zip code 92404 separates me from all the other zip code areas in the city of San Bernardino, the state of California, the country USA, North America, Canada, Lake Great Planet Earth. And then the street logo, spelled L-U-G-O, separates my street from all the other streets 
the zip code area of 92404, etc., etc., etc. And in 3934, it separates the apartment complex that I live in from all the other apartment complex in the entire world. Apartment 14 separates my apartment from all the other apartments in 3934 of the street North Lugo from all the other streets in the zip code area 92404 separates me from all the other zip code areas City of San Bernardino State of California USA North American continent Lake Great Planet Earth and then my last name separates me from anyone else living in that apartment by another last name and there better not be anyone else by another last name and then my first name Josh separates me from three and a half billion people in the world your address is significant I guess some people just have general delivery but anyway <laughs> your address separates you from everyone else in the world now I believe God has written an address to separate his son from everyone that has ever lived in all of history past, present and future you could also call this the great drama. When I give this talk at Christmas, I call it the Christmas drama, leading up to the birth of Jesus. It makes a tremendous message. Any Christmas banquet, you speak at anything, either for evangelism or just to build up the Christians. You can call it the Christmas drama and use Galatians 4.4, 4, where it says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, the fullness of time there means, literally in the Greek, when every exact detail had been completed. When every exact detail had been completed, God sent forth his Son. Now, what are some of these details? Well, you have prophecy and then historical preparation. Today, we want to deal with prophecy. Every exact detail. Now, I want to give you a chart that I use in giving this talk in the university or anywhere else I'm speaking. And I draw the diagram out when I'm talking to somebody individually after I've gone through the four laws with them, shared my testimony, and they still say, well, I just can't believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Then I'll either go into the Lord, Liar, Lunatic, Messianic Prophecy, or the Resurrection, one of the three. These are just a few of 60 major prophecies and 200 some ramifications of them. All fulfilled in one individual, God writing an address to identify one man. Let's look at these. First one, we go back to Genesis 3.15. And there it says that one of the identifications of the Messiah, in fact in the Talmud it uses the word Messiah, as you will see when you read this chapter, says that his identification is that he would be from the seed of a woman. Now this is the only man that is ever referred to as the seed of coming from the seed of the woman. Everybody else is the seed of the man. But in this case, it's the seed of the woman. Then we go down to recorded time in Genesis 9, 26 and following. In Genesis 10, 2. Up to there. Noah had three sons. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Now all the nations in the world can be traced back to one of these three people. Ethnologically. Now God eliminates two-thirds of the nations in the world when it says that this man would be through the lineage of Shem. Two-thirds of the nations of the world were eliminated. Now we go down to Genesis 12, 17 and 22. God called a man out of the earth of the Chaldees by the name of Abram because he believed God and trusted in, you might say, the prophecies. He was called Abraham. What God did through Abraham was this. Is that he called Abraham out and made him a special race. The Jews. His descendants would be the Jews. And what God did was eliminate all the other races in the world except for one. The Jews. Abraham had two sons in Genesis 17 and 21. Isaac and Ishmael. And now God eliminates 50% of the line of Abraham of the race of the Jews, of the meanings of Shem, of the seed of the woman. Now Isaac, we find in Genesis 28 and Numbers 24, had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now God eliminates 
50% of the line of Isaac. And says that this man will be identified because he will come to the line of Jacob. Now any math major will start seeing the probability building up. Then in Genesis 49.10, it narrows it down further. Jacob had how many sons? Twelve. Each one became a Jewish tribe or a Hebrew tribe. And now God eliminates eleven twelfths of the descendants of Jacob. And says that this man will come through the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah. Shiloh there, as you will see when you read the chapters, reference to the Messiah. And then we go to Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. Within the tribe of Judah, there were many family lines. And now God eliminates all the family lines of the tribe of Judah, of the lineage of Jacob, of the line of Isaac, of the race of the Jews, of the lineage of Shem, of the seed of the woman. It says that this man will be through the family line of Jesse. Now we go down to 1 Chronicles 7, 2 Samuel 7. In the family line of Jesse, there were many houses. Jesse had eight children. And now God eliminates seven eighths of the family line of Jesse. It says that this man will not only be of the seed of the woman, the lineage of Shem, the race of the Jews, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, the family of Jesse, but it would be through the house of David. Then we go down to around 1012 B.C. in Psalm 22. Another characteristic of this man is that his hands and his feet would be pierced, as in crucifixion. Hands and his feet would be pierced. This was written around 800 years before crucifixion was put into effect in a Jewish province. Then we go down to Isaiah 9, 6 and Isaiah 7, 14. And it gives another characteristic of this man to single him out from everyone that's ever lived. And it says this, that this man will have a divine nature. People will look at him and call him the mighty God. He will be called the righteous branch. Now that separates him from a lot of people. Just about everyone but my wife. No. <laughs> so see, it's narrowed down further. It says not only the seed of the woman, the legion of Shem, the race of the Jews, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, the family of Jesse, the house of David, be crucified, but have a divine nature. And then God narrows it down even further. In Isaiah 52 and 53 and Isaiah 11.10, it points out, Another characteristic of this man is that he would be rejected by his own people but believed in by his enemies. Rejected by his own people but believed in by his enemies. You especially get this in the last few verses of chapter 52 of Isaiah. Where the king that knew did not believe and the king that had not known the Gentiles believed. And then we narrow it down even further. In Psalm 41, in Zechariah 11, it gives various ramifications to identify this man. Identification is this. Now look at the ramifications of this prophecy. He'd be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces, not 29.99 girls, 30 pieces of silver. What was the coinage of that day? Gold. But the prophecy stepped out of the coins of the day and said he'd be betrayed for silver. How'd they know it? Thirty pieces of silver. It'd be thrown on the floor, not placed on the table or anything. It'd be cast on the floor. It'd be in the temple and be used to buy a pot or steel. Do you see the ramifications? Betrayed by a friend, thirty pieces of silver thrown on the floor in the temple used to buy a pot or steel. And it narrows it down further and says that this man will not only be of the seed of the woman, the lineage of Shem, the race of the Jews, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, the family of Joseph, the house of David, be crucified, divine nature, believed in by his enemies, rejected by his own people, betrayed by a friend, thirty pieces of silver, thrown on the floor, on, in the temple, used to buy a potter's field. But then God narrows it down even further. In Micah 5 2, written around 710 BC, he narrows it down when at this time God eliminates all the cities in the world except for one. One city. 
Here he says that his entrance in Micah 5.2 would be in the city of Bethlehem. Less than a thousand in heaven at that time when it was prognosticated. But it narrows it down even further to identify this man that would come into the world as a savior. God writing an address. Now, somebody will say, as one philosophy professor said to me, and I gave this in a philosophy class, he said, look, Mr. McDowell, this is all just a coincidence. He literally said that it's all a coincidence. He said, well, I could find some of these prophecies fulfilled in Anwar Sadat and Pompidou and Nasser and Kennedy and Martin Luther King, Isaac Spiral Agnew, etc. And most Christians would sit there and say, hmm, you got a point. Maybe it is a coincidence. Oh, no, it isn't. And I spoke up and I said, sir, maybe one or two. But all 60 major ones with 200 and some ramifications? Uh-uh. In fact, I said, sir, if you can just find 20 of these prophecies fulfilled in any other individual in history apart from Jesus Christ, just 20, the Victory Publishing Company in Denver, Colorado will give you a $1,000 reward. And there's a lot of men that could make a little money by just backing up what they say. But they can't. In fact, the Victory Publishing Company will give anyone a $1,000 reward that just finds 20 prophecies from any book about a man coming into the world and these prophecies were written down before the man was born. Just 20 prophecies fulfilled in his life and give you a $1,000 reward. It's impossible unless God's the author. Dr. Peter Stoner, and I documented him in my book, gave some probabilities of these prophecies being fulfilled in any one individual in history. In fact, he puts it down to just any description of any man. You don't want to call it a prophecy, just a description. And these descriptions being fulfilled in a man born after they were written down. And I documented him in it. Evidence that demands a verdict. Let's look at some of these. Now, I also put in there the president of the American scientific affiliation or something like that they've gone over these prophecies and the probabilities of Dr. Stoner and said that they were accurate using the modern science of probability now this is what he said let's just take eight of the prophecies the probability that just eight of these prophecies could be fulfilled in any one individual would be one in every one times ten to the 17th power. That would be 17 zeros. Now our minds cannot comprehend that. At least mine can. Now let me give you an illustration that Stoner gave that could communicate this probability of 1 in every 10 to the 17th power. He said to take the state of Texas. You know, I like Texas. I shared the other night a, the story that happened to a Texan. He came to Los Angeles. And he was at Disneyland. You know, phone calls can be pretty expensive in Los Angeles. Sometimes literally long distance call across the street. And this Texan made a long distance call in downtown L.A. from Anaheim where Disneyland is. And the operator said, that'll be 35 cents, please. And the Texan said, 35 cents? He said, why, well, Texas, you can call to hell and back for a nickel. And the operator said, yes, sir, but that's a local call there. <laughs> he said, you take the state of Texas... Two feet deep of silver dollars. Take one silver dollar, put a little check on it. And then mix up the entire state, two feet deep of silver dollars. Use a bulldozer if you prefer. And then blindfold a man. And the probability that that blindfolded man would pick that check silver dollar the first time in the entire state of Texas, two feet deep of silver dollars. Is the same probability for eight of these prophecies being fulfilled in any one individual. No wonder the Victory Publishing Company offers a $1,000 reward. It's sure bet. Let's look at 48. 48 of these prophecies being fulfilled in any one individual. It would be one in every one times ten to the 157th power for just 48 of these prophecies. Now, 
Let me give you an illustration that will communicate the probability of 1 in every 1 times 10 to the 157th power. An inch line of electrons. To count those electrons in this line, and counting 250 minutes with your eyes open, would take you 19 million years. Now, take a cubic inch of electrons. To count the electrons in a cubic inch at 250 minutes with your eyes open, would take you 19 million years times, not plus, times 19 million years, times 19 million years just to count them with your eyes open. Now take one of those electrons, put a little check on it, and then throw it back in. You don't have to mix it up, just throw it back in. This illustration is from Dr. Stone. Now, take that guy we left blindfolded down in Texas. And the probability that that blindfolded man would pick that check electron, the first pick, that would take you with your eyes open 19 million years times 19 million years times 19 million years just to count it is the same probability of 1 in every 1 times 10 to the 157th power. And the probability of 48 of these prophecies being fulfilled in any one individual. No wonder Jesus appealed to fulfill prophecy. To substantiate his claims as the Messiah. What a savior. We have nothing to shame of. God never called us to shelve our brains. But our minds were created to work in harmony with our hearts. Because my heart cannot rejoice in what my mind rejects. And boy, when you look at the prophecies, it sure satisfies the mind and causes the heart to rejoice.